Burry pulls out a market melt up. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Insights brought to you by Ainsley Bullion and the Gold and Silver Standard. Today, we welcome back Sam, who's been looking further into the fallout from that big miss in the CPI numbers that we were talking about just yesterday, and specifically what they mean uh, or mean for Michael Burry and his trade that um, we've actually been following for a little while now. So how are you going today, Sam? Good, Chris. Excited to get into it. Yeah, it's, it was an interesting one. And I know we've been talking about it. You've been talking about it a bit. Um, Branko was talking about it a little while ago, this Michael Burry trade. So um, it looks like he's pulled out. So there was a big discussion around that $1.6 billion short position that he had. Um, what do you think that means for him and for the markets generally from what we've seen? Well, um, the the Hollywood movie and the book definitely helped him. So pretty much everything he does, everything he doesn't do is something that retail traders like to look at. Sometimes it's a bit exaggerated. Like in this case, you know, this 1.6 billion, it is notional value, meaning that it's a leveraged trade. It's not like mm -hmm. he took uh, $1.6 billion out of the uh, company kitty and embedded on the stock market going down. It's just a, a leveraged trade. He could have potentially just had a couple million riding on that. And now this is, uh, these are positions that were closed previously. This isn't something that's, you know, just happened this, this minute. So right. look, it's, it's just reorganizing of his portfolio, but it is interesting that he's not specifically focusing on shorting major U.S. indices. Uh, like the S and P 500 or or the Nasdaq. Uh, the next thing is he hasn't necessarily changed to bullish either. So that doesn't necessarily mean he doesn't think that the U.S. stock market's going to go down. In fact, he just moved his uh, bets over onto something else. He's going after semiconductors, so he's specifically targeting semiconductor uh, manufacturers. And as we've seen, these have these have had you know an insane bull run upwards. They've, they've mm. pretty much been the only positive news in, in the markets. Uh, they've been the highlight of the tech space. They've been the highlight of everything, you know, companies like NVIDIA. So all he's, all he's doing is moving to a different short. It doesn't necessarily mean that he doesn't think one thing's going to go down. It might just mean he thinks uh, semiconductors are going to go down more. So, And, and that's uh, always going to be like the hardest possible trade really to be short against bullish momentum i mean that that's wiped a lot of um a lot of potential big traders or, or actual big traders out in the past hasn't it uh yeah it has uh, but but look it's um i mean being being bearish against the s&p 500 would have been very dangerous uh <laughs> during that cpi print as well so yeah so yeah, I guess he's. Uh, we'll, we'll see how he goes on shorting those those semiconductors. Yeah, well, I mean, at least it's a little bit more narrow than sort of the whole market. Um, and yeah, it, it when the market moves against you like that, it can be difficult because, of course, there's a unlimited upside when it when when the market does break out like it has been. Um, on that sort of level, on that topic, we haven't really had a crash yet. So, do you see that as a good thing? Because you've been talking about this quite a bit. So. Is it a good thing? Is there a scenario um, that's actually worse us not seeing the crash yet? Because there's certainly something that you've been um, warning us of the potential for. Yes, well, um, I've, I've talked a lot about and written articles about the double dip recession in the 80s and how it looked like you know it wouldn't happen until it did. But um, firstly, on the topic of is there something worse than a market crash? Well, yes, there is. And I think, in my opinion, that would be a melt up. Hmm. And what we're seeing now is being called a melt up by some, and that's, uh, you know, bad news is coming out. People don't really care. They think that stock market is just going to keep going up. There's going to be a pivot. Um, if you want to see a successful stock market, because people are saying, hey, this is good. There's no hard landing. We'll just, we'll just melt up. Well, that's what Venezuela did. I mean, Venezuela had their stock market increase 200,000%. In a very short period of time, so why yeah, weren't they celebrating? That country must be doing very, very well then for the market to go up by two hundred thousand percent. <laughs> oh, let's move there. So, but what people forget is, I mean, they're valuing their stock market in their currency, and what really happened was just the currency devalued. People forget um, there's a there's a country, United States, and we have our local currency that other people happen to use a lot more than the Venezuelan currency. Um, but that being said, it is just 
pricing local stocks and local currency. And much of the so-called success we've seen after 2020 of the stock market, you know, pumping was actually just the currency devaluing. Mm. And you had your superstar companies saying they're, um, you know, going up 22% in a year when actually they've only really gone up 2% a year. And there's some of the top companies, the 20% was done by inflation. Yes. And then you have other companies saying they you know, they're red hot and they're they're doing 18% uh, percent a year and actually they're losing 2% a year. They're just getting all this free money and it's making them feel like they're successful when they're not. Um, so that's uh I, I think a, a melt up is a is a bad thing because it's more of what we've already experienced and it's pretty much giving up on the currency and saying well let's just print and make everyone happy in the short term and uh, essentially do what every fiat currency does it dies but but kill it off quickly on a big high so sort of on that do you think that this is actually a likely scenario here do you think that we are entering this sort of melt up phase do you think it will really happen i i don't think they will let a melt up happen one, I think that would be too irresponsible hmm. to, I, I don't think it would be in anyone's interest to have a melt up. Um, even Wall Street, if Wall Street wants to see stocks go higher, well, Wall Street, they're they're the biggest shorters of markets as well. I hmm. mean, if, if the market crashes, they'll benefit as well because they'll do short positions. Retail traders, mom and dad traders, they're the ones who buy only and then sell at a loss. So I don't think it would really benefit anyone if they don't, you know, crash the stock market or, you know, do what do what they've did before and raise interest rates and or just hold them high and, and let things correct. Now, the um if the Fed wanted the stock market to go down and not melt up, what might they do? Well, they might ignore the good CPI print that just happened and keep beating on the same drum they've been beating on. Now, surprise, surprise, what's just happened? Uh, Mary Daly from the Fed has come out in a newspaper interview, and um, she said, you know, it's it's very, uh, it's very positive sign, but they can't be too sure if, if inflation's under control. Uh, the, the quote she actually said was, uh, we don't know. So she said, we have to be bold enough to say we don't know in regard to the uh, inflation and CPI data. Well, if you don't know, then why are you commenting on the CPI data? What's the yeah. point of doing the reading? It's essentially like saying, um, uh, let, let's let's all look and trade and make our policy around this big announcement, uh, which we don't believe at all. Okay, and, then why are we talking about it? And that's really, um, I've had this conversation, we were talking about this with Branko over the last sort of couple of weeks and um, people saying that in the comments as well. The issue we have is that it, with the, with the labor data, it was just ridiculous because they were just revising it. <laughs> Absurd revisions that were coming on um, every month. So you get the number that looks really good, and then a month later, you know, a completely different number that's very, you know, shows a completely different picture. Then with the CPI data, you've got. It, we were saying they manipulate it in a different way because they just say, well, okay, we're not using a standard definition anymore. We're going to have 15 different variations on what we consider to be CPI. So, you know, when you when you talk about that quote that you just use where we don't know, they're just picking and choosing what they want to use what, to suit the day, it seems. So it makes the whole thing very murky, but I suppose you're possibly arguing here that, that that's very deliberate because it gives them the flexibility to do what they need to do. Yeah, that's what they need. It looks like they're just clawing for another reason to hold interest rates high because the worst nightmare of what could have happened for them did happen in an already manipulated uh, basket of statistics uh, didn't work in their favor. And that's probably not what they wanted to see. And then you can see the, the stock market take off again. And if you remember um, back when Powell was was being more of a cowboy, he was essentially saying, if the stock market keeps going up, we're going to crash it. <laughs> because that's a that's a sign of people uh you know increasing the velocity of money working against the fed putting spending money when they when they don't want people to be mm. uh, throwing money around and um the thing is the the markets keep getting the fed wrong 
So there's there's this big takeoff upward in in the S and P and in you know risk markets. But have the markets been correct uh, for the last few months or for the year, or have they pretty much uh, done something and the Fed comes out and says the opposite and 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 knocks them back down? So. Um, I'm not sure if the markets are interpreting this correctly, that there's not going to be any more rate hikes or the, or they're essentially going to pivot sooner than they said. And even if they do pivot, we know statistically, as we always say, the crash always comes after the pivot. So what's everyone doing? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point because we, we, they hadn't, we haven't got it right. It's been very, very challenging, um, partly for those reasons that we just said where you've got such a mixture of what people, what, what the Fed has said, but also what the data said and the manipulation and all of that becomes really complicated. But let's just work on the assumption for the moment that this crash does come um, because you've certainly laid that argument out consistently of of why we should see that. And I mean, I doubt a little bit, a bit only because of the election next year, but then that, you know, the election is still a long way away. Um, we can have a crash and, and be back well and truly in recovery before that comes about. But if we do see that crash, what do you see the the fallout being or how do you see that playing out for gold in particular? Is it is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? How because gold it's is has even been complex to follow um what the correlation is there for good news is bad news, bad news is good news, that sort of scenario. Yeah. How how do you see it playing out? Yeah, well, firstly, I do agree that there's plenty of time for a crash and a stimulus to happen, especially when markets are so um, I guess you could say ADHD. People are willing to do anything on a, um, you know, at the drop of a hat to make a, a profit from shorting, a profit from buying. So they're all over the place. Uh, but recently, gold, specifically in AUD, so gold priced in AUD has moved very opposite to uh, the the price of the stock market, which is a really good thing for someone who's trying to hedge against the stock market because it can be quite hard when you're only hedging against, I guess, basically inflation because that sends everything up. Uh, yes. the, the rising tide lifts all boats or you, know, you value everything in currency and the currency is devaluing while everything goes up. But in this situation, uh, it looks like gold is very specifically having... Uh, safe haven status, especially gold with the AUD. The Australian dollar has been quite strong recently as well, which is really good because it makes gold uh, affordable now, which is something we don't usually get with the Australian dollar is uh, a, a little bit of strength. It's usually uh, it's it's usually negative corrections to, to go back down uh, weaker than the US dollar, but we, we do have a bit of an advantage uh, recently with the AUD strength and the US dollar getting weaker to actually be able to buy some gold. So look, if this correlation continues, this negative correlation of gold in the stock market, a stock market crash would be great. Yep. And that that does make sense. And particularly like you've highlighted there in Aussie dollars, it um we we probably end up with the double benefit of that um really pushing those prices higher potentially in that scenario. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, well, thanks so much for that today, Sam. Um, really great discussion. I'm really um, like starting off there with the the Michael Burry stuff, but really following the whole the whole gamut of what could be happening here. It, it was great to get your insight on that because um, it, it is a tricky one, and I'm very curious to see how it unfolds over the days ahead. Because at the moment, the markets are certainly um, not behaving how how you could argue they should be. So um, always, <laughs> always value your input on that. Thanks, Chris. Um, thanks, everyone, for watching. Remember, if you have any questions or comments, reach out on those social platforms. That's us for today and for this week as well. Um, we'll be back on Tuesday next week with Alex to discuss all things markets and metals. Until then, have a great rest of the day and rest of the week, everyone.